Okay, thanks very much. Um, it's great that you are all here, and it's a real privilege for me as a member of the Faculty of Philosophy at St. Patrick's just to open this up and to welcome you all here. I saw some of you last night, and we all had a great time last night. I've already declared the conference a success, okay? We got talking philosophy, and you all discovered the roost, so it's a success already. Um, I suppose, given that I'm quite well known for my work on a certain philosopher called Thomas, and I see a whole army of Dominicans here, so I'm going to have to mention Thomas at some point. Um, here's the Thomas I want to talk about, Thomas Nagel. Okay, <laughs> so, so we're going to be Thomists here for a, a while of the Nagelian variety, if we can call it that. And what I want to talk about is Nagel's notion of philosophizing as a view from nowhere. What Nagel talks about is there's this constant temptation in philosophy towards a kind of a dualism, an irreducible dualism. And this is particularly the case in modern philosophy. So in modern philosophy, what we see is this dualism of two poles, the subject and the object. Okay, so we have this sort of um, preoccupation in modern philosophy with subjectivity and objectivity, and how do we overcome the one with the other? And what Nagel points out is that it can be quite tempting to see objectivity as sort of are passing over a pre-reflective subjective outlook. We need to exorcise the subject, get rid of the subject, just so that objects can appear, just so that we can see things in their pure objectivity. This is the view from nowhere. We can't take a view on things from anywhere because that introduces a kind of a subjectivity into our view of things. So we, we take a view from nowhere. So in order to be objective, we have to view these things from nowhere. So their subjective, their objectivity simply appears to well, nothing at all. So, for things to be objective, the appearances can't be appearances to anything. They simply have to be there. So, analyzed that way, it's a bit of a silly position. Philosophy then done objectively in this point is philosophy done from nowhere. It's a philosophy which is done not from anywhere, and certainly not by a philosopher. It's as if philosophy just appears somewhere. So, it just comes down as sort of ethereal, and maybe the philosopher tunes into it in some way. So we can't philosophize from anywhere on this account, and we can't philosophize from within a tradition, a school, a viewpoint, anything like that. Now, the source of this dualism on Nagel's analysis is that a single world reality, it can't contain both irreducible points of view. We feel this tension um, in this irreducibility that the world can't contain both points of view. So in the practice of philosophy, there tends to be this conviction that you can't philosophize from within a tradition, a school, a viewpoint, and yet pursue good philosophy. Descartes, we just need to get rid of all that, undermine it all. Kant, everything before Kant was nonsense. Anything that was pre-critical, we can't do. We need to do philosophy afresh. So we have to philosophize from nowhere, from a disinterested, non-subjective starting point. This strive for objectivity as a view from nowhere, it begins to run into trouble when we have to try to accommodate something which is revealed subjectively, i.e. when we need to try to accommodate the subject. So this attempt to philosophize from nowhere, this view from nowhere, runs into trouble when we try to take into consideration the subject, and particularly the subjectivity of the subject. When we want to say something objective about the subject, we need to treat the subject, okay, the self, as a particular kind of object. If we want to say something objective about it, we need to take the subject as an object of a special kind. So it brings forth the temptation to turn the subject into a thing. The subject becomes a thing so that it's readily available uh, to us to kind of introspect upon, to look at, to try to analyze and deal with. But when we think about the subject as a thing, we seek out what's purely subject, subjective about it, and we end up isolating the subject to the ego, the res cogitans, the mind, the soul. We don't think of the subject in its wholeness. We try to isolate that one thing within the subject that makes it itself, its pure, its essence. Um, and so the subject loses its subjectivity on that account. It becomes just another object, albeit of a very special kind. We no longer have subjectivity. We've just, you know, come up with some sort of new substance, an immaterial mind, an ego, something like that, and that's going to explain what the subject is. But that doesn't help us deal with the problems of subjectivity. That just pushes them to an immaterial place. If we can't deal with subjectivity in the material world, how can we deal with subjectivity in an immaterial world? Why does things being immaterial make subjectivity easier to deal with? That's Nagel's point. 
This strive to philosophize from nowhere must always fail because philosophy can't fail to consider not only the subject, personal identity, mind, body issues, that sort of thing, ethics, but everything that is subjective, subjectively disclosed to the subject, what it is like to be in a subjective state. When we try to cast that out in objective terms, we always lose something there. We always lose the subjectivity of that subjective state, the, the subject's existential situation. And this is a point that Nagel really pushed home in a paper of his, what it's like to be a bat. So way, way back, he published that really famous paper that there is something that it's like to be in a subjective state. And when you try to catch that by objective descriptions, you always lose that subjectivity. It's the individual, the individual subject, the individual substance, which occupies both viewpoints. The philosopher philosophizes out of a tradition. The philosopher is both subject and object. He is within a tradition, but he, I'm thinking of myself here, so you can replace he for she if it's yourself. The philosopher philosophizes out of a tradition. He philosophizes, uh, but he engages out of that tradition. He philosophizes from somewhere, and he goes somewhere. He, gauge, he engages with what is outside that tradition. And this means philosophizing at what I'm calling the intersection. And as I was writing this, and the more I wrote this, I thought to myself, talking about philosophizing from the intersection, and all of a sudden I started saying philosophizing from the middle, and I was like, oh God, I'm now William Desmond. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's been an influence that crept in there. So it's going to start sounding a little bit similar. So philosophizing at the intersection. From the beginnings of philosophy, there's always been this tendency to univocalize being, to treat being as a univocal notion, capturable by some concept or by some very well-defined set of concepts. That's the case whether, whether or not you want to have some single, all-encompassing Parmenidean account of being, or maybe you might have a set of strictly well-defined categories um, which just perfectly capture the nature of reality. Philosophizing from nowhere means philosophizing from within some very well-defined set of concepts or single concepts because they are out there. Those categories are out there and we can philosophize about them because they're independent of us and they'll tell us what being is like. By contrast, when we philosophize at the intersection, that means recognizing something that Plato recognized, that being, reality, it's neither univocal nor equivocal, it's plurivocal, it's analogical. It can be both one and many. Reality can include both poles of the one and the many appearance in reality. So whilst disclosed through certain concepts, being or reality, it transcends all these very strict univocalizing concepts that we apply to it. So the way in which we represent being has to be necessarily very rich and multifaceted. So no single concept or set of concepts will exhaust our individual subjective experience of reality. They just can't do it. It's we who have to philosophize about being. We experience being, and then we try to represent that, our experience of being objectively, always with the proviso that what we're representing conceptually uh, may not be adequate to the concepts that we're using. And so that's why I like this picture. You know, I didn't put up the duck rabbit example. I put up, you know, the young lady, old woman example. Sort of being is kind of like that. You look at it one way, and it's the young lady, but you look at it the other way, and it's the old lady. So being is like that. When, when we use a very strict univocal, univocalizing concepts about being, we end up with a picture like this, and we can't really get a handle on things. Are we just focused on the young lady, or are we focused on the old lady? So this tendency to univocalize being within a single concept or set of concepts brings with it an assumption that our intellects are not attuned to truth. The truth isn't the goal or the finality of our intellects. Um, this is apparent in, you know, the pre-Socratic concern about the one and the many, appearance and reality, but it's much more apparent in post-Cartesian concerns about certainty, that being does, or, that our intellects don't naturally reside in the truth. If being is disclosed via, exclusively, via a single concept or set of concepts, there's always going to be some intermediation between us and being via those concepts. If these are the concepts or the concept that we have to use to get at being, being will always have to be intermediated via that. So it's not being that we naturally take rest in, it's this set of concepts that our intellect finds tractable and can deal with. We may get a handle on being in some sort of way, by some sort of sophisticated technique, but we're continually under some sort of conceptual illusion of something which is other, and elusively other, uh, which is being represented by concepts that we find that we can take rest in.
Philosophizing from the intersection, I'm going to suggest, means taking seriously the notion that the intellect is attuned to truth as its proper object. We don't pass over the object for the subject, nor vice versa. We don't limit being to a strict concept or set of concepts. Being doesn't appear via representational intermediaries. Rather, being brings in the operation. Certain conceptual episodes or capacities that we have that are native to us as subjects, and so there's an interplay between I as an individual, my intellect, and the reality with which I'm engaged, and neither can be reduced to the other. So my agency is operative in receptivity, and intellect comes to rest in the true when it receives and engages with reality. So attack and defend the center line. I had to get this in. I'm a martial artist, and we talk about attacking and defending the center line. And so I'm going to make a philosophical connection here with that. So you came to my news, you know, Gavin Kerr made a connection between philosophy and martial arts. So the philosopher philosophizes out of a tradition, a school from a certain position, not from nowhere. Uh, so there's always a tendency to identify the philosopher with that school. I was just chatting with Professor Klima yesterday about isms and about how, you know, somebody gets subsumed into an ism. And you don't engage with the philosopher, you end up engaging with the ism. And maybe the philosopher thinks something that the ism, you know, doesn't represent. One ends up being labelled as a member of a particular school and summarily just dismissed based on crude caricatures. You know, he's a neo-scholastic Viking thomist, something like that. Um, he could never possibly think in this way, that sort of thing. God help us, you know, he's one of them, you know, so he reads Ed Fieser, so dismiss that. We don't deal with that. That's the sort of tendency that we get in philosophy. If the desire for objectivity to the exclusion of the subject and the subject's subjectivity is problematic, so too, I would suggest, is the focus, the hyper-focus on subjectivity at the expense of the object, at the expense of reality, at the expense of being, at the expense of what the philosopher is trying to get at. There is something that it's like to be in a subjective state that objective descriptions just can't capture. But there's also a reality that the philosopher seeks to understand and affirm. And it's the philosopher trying to understand that reality, not some sort of ism. If the philosopher is just coming along and just sees Aquinas and just wants to be a Thomist, well and good, but it's not being a philosopher, okay? So he's not trying to be a philosopher, he's just trying to be a Thomist. A philosopher is trying to understand reality. And if he comes to agree with Aquinas, and he's a good person to agree with, well and good, but he's being a philosopher then. There is a reality independent of us in which the philosopher is seeking to become attuned because the philosopher, the, the intellect takes rest in the truth, the truth about being. So we have to resist the temptation to categorize the philosopher through some sort of ism because a particular philosopher may be able to hold in balance issues within two isms that seem to be mutually opposed and contradictory, but the philosopher might be able to find a third way between the two of them um, because it is he is the one that thinks through the problematic position. Okay, this is how we defend and attack the center line here. When we try to understand and affirm reality, the philosopher's position becomes his own. It's he who philosophizes. He is at the intersection where subject and object meet. So it's his position which needs to be interrogated, and it's his position which needs to be defended. Engaging with another philosopher, we focus on the center line, the intersection, this is the space where the philosopher is engaged and occupied. The, so we have to attack the philosopher on his own terms. We can't just say, you know, oh, well, he's one of this and he's one of that. We have to actually read what he writes and engage with him with what he writes. But also this means that when we do philosophy, we need to defend the center line, okay? So if somebody hits me with a difficult question in philosophy, I can't just go to my Aquinas and, you know, open up Aquinas and see how he answers it. I have to try and answer it myself. And if I happen to agree with Aquinas through his inspiration, well and good. But if I, have to, if I happen to come up with a solution which comes from Kant or Hegel, um, well and good also, okay? Don't be another Thomist, okay? Be another Thomas, that's the idea, okay? Try to be your own philosopher, be inspired by these people, but try to do philosophy yourself and engage with the problematics in philosophy yourself. This sort of gets me to what I think is the future of Christian thinking, the theme of the conference. I've been depicting a continual tendency in philosophy to collapse one of two poles into another. This arises out of a certain conviction that reality can't admit of two irreducible viewpoints. One has to be sort of swallowed up, consumed, Parmenidean style, by the other. And that's very manifest in modern philosophy in the dichotomy of subject and object. My suggestion 
as I've been suggesting, is we practice philosophy at the intersection where the two irreducible poles meet and come together. We don't try to swallow them up into each other. We find the intersection where they meet, um, and that's the position that the philosopher occupies. So this is, what I, this is what I think this has to contribute to Christian thinking. Philosophers occupy in this space where subjectivity and objectivity meet. Being is disclosed to the philosopher in sort of realizing that disclosure of being one becomes a philosopher. Philosoph the philosopher has an experience of being as subject and seeks to represent that as object. And that's the case for the Christian life, I'm going to suggest. We experience God, we have this experience of disclosure of God through the mediation of the sacraments, liter the liturgy, scripture. We're subjects of that experience. There is something that it is like to have that experience of God, and we seek to articulate that objectively. When we articulate our experience of God in objective terms, we do the work of the traditional philosophers, theologians. We write summas. That's the sort of thing that we do. We put together a philosophical theology, all with well-organized objections, replies. We systematize our thinking about the Christian mysteries. So we have that experience, and then we try to represent it, and that's when we produce uh, the systematic theology. But just as there's a tendency in philosophy to overlook the subject for objects, so too in the Christian life, we can overlook the lived experience of God that we've all had for the truths about God that we affirm. We end up affirming the truths about God, and they're all well and good, and we need to do that. But sometimes we do that at the expense of the lived experience of God, at the expense of the mystical side of things. So we often see this in interminable disputes about God's existence and nature, okay? So God's existence, existential inertia, God's simplicity, non-simplicity, all these disputes which just seem to be interminable. And it's as if God had nothing better to do than to exist. And it just, I need to read you the quote from this great Belfast man, okay, C.S. Lewis. It's a brilliant quote. Um, there have been men before who got so interested in proving the existence of God that they came to care nothing for God himself, as if the good Lord had nothing to do but to exist. There have been some who were so preoccupied with spreading Christianity that they never gave a thought to Christ. The idea here in that captures what I'm suggesting, that when we become so preoccupied with how we objectively represent our experience of God, we lose the lived experience of God. And then, so our Christianity becomes a shell, becomes hollow. Um, it, it's right and just that classical theists defend classical theism. We need to do that. We need to have rigorous systematic thinking. That's, that's great. Um, Christian thinking won't have a future unless it has that sort of philosophy behind it, and no problem with that. But what happens when classical theism is no longer under dispute? What happens when William Lee and Craig and Ram Mullins say, yes, Aquinas was right, it's divine simplicity, divine eternity, timelessness. What do we do then? Um, take the golden period of scholasticism. So if any of you know these great men, that's Aquinas, Bonaventure, and Albert, but I don't need to tell you guys that. Um, and I had to represent the Dominicans here, so we've got two Dominicans and the Franciscan up there. We have this golden period, the 13th century. We have all these figures. Classical theism isn't under dispute. Here, William Lane Craig, Ran Mullins aren't challenging, you know, Aquinas and Bonaventure and all. It's not under dispute. Um, the Christianity of these men, it, did, it wasn't just about establishing classical theism as an indisputable truth. Rather, the end of their Christianity was sainthood. That was their goal. They were trying to become saints. They had this experience of God by which they be felt motivated to become saints, and in striving to become saints, they produced the theology that they did. Their experience of God, and this is something that a student really kind of brought out forcefully for me, and so I'm using it in this lecture, their experience of God, it wasn't the Pla Pla Plato's prisoner leaving the cave and just seeing the light. It was the cave breaking down entirely and becoming possessed by the light of the sun. The key of the walls, the walls of their hearts were just broken and the divine light just came into them. And that's what's urged them forward in doing their philosophy. So um, they weren't primarily def uh, motivated by a desire to defend a position with the best that scientific rationality could afford. That was secondary. That was, what they, that was kind of just a step upon the way because um, what urged them was the love of Christ. They had all fallen in love with Christ and having fallen in love with him, they sought to know more about him and lead others to him. So that scholastic project, you know, of answering every possible question about God, creation, man, all the rest, that's often ridiculed today for overlooking the individual, for overlooking the believing subject. That might be a charge attributable to later scholastics. I don't think it's one that can be leveled at Albert Bonaventure and Thomas. That's because what drives them to do their philosophy and theology 
in the first place is a desire to become a saint. Um, the task of philosophizing at the intersection where subject and object meet, I think is one that can be applied to the Christian life. To philosophize at the intersection means not passing over the subject in favor of objects, but also not reducing being to a matter of subjective disclosures. It's to hold both in a balance. So being brings in the operation capacities of the subject without which there would be no disclosure of being. The reflective Christian philosopher experiences the love of God, the one who is wholly other than the philosopher, and that experience is one had by the Christian philosopher and carries with it its own subjective conditions. We all have our own experience of God. We all have our own cave, which God's grace breaks down in our own particular ways, and that has its own subjectivity, its own phenomenology to it. And they're brought up, but those subjective conditions, they're brought into an operation by an other self, something genuinely other than the subject, a self that draws the philosopher, in this case, to himself. So the reflective Christian philosopher in being drawn to God is led to articulate and affirm truths about the one he has experienced. And so out of that experience, then, the Christian philosopher affirms truths about God independent of himself as a philosopher. The pursuit, the pursuit of sainthood in the life of the Christian philosopher, then, I suggest, overflows into an affirmation of systematic truths which are affirmable about God. And so a philosophical practice that occupies either pole of the intersection ends up collapsing all the truths about God into truths about our personal experiences of God, um, or it reverts to affirming those truths affirmable about God that wholly exclude our experience of them. And neither, I'm going to suggest, provide for good Christian thinking. So if Christian thinking is to have a future, Christian thinkers, I'm going to suggest, have to philosophize from the intersection in which God and the subject meet. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening.